Hello, and welcome to Empower Our Futures March Empower Hour. My name is Mary Pettigrew, and I'm a member of the Empower Our Future Communications team. Tonight, we're going to hear from experts who are intimately familiar with Excel's Clean Heat Plan and who have been following closely the proceedings regarding the plan at the Public Utilities Commission and, in fact, providing testimony there. Now, I'd like to read the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge with respect as non-Native people that the land on which we stand, live, and learn is the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arap Arapaho peoples. We also recognize the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. We honor elders past, present, and future, and those who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We also recognize that our government, academic, and cultural institutions, and our nation itself were founded upon and continue to enact exclusions and erasures of Indigenous peoples. May this acknowledgement demonstrate a commitment to working to dismantle ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, oppression, and inequities, and to recognize the hundreds of Indigenous nations who continue to resist, live, create, and uphold their sacred relations across their lands. Let us seek to understand what it means to be in right relationship today with the traditional stewards of this land and with this land itself and all the creatures that inhabit it. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Dr. Chuck Kutcher, a fellow and senior research associate of the University of Colorado Boulder Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute is here. He is also a member of the policy committee of the Colorado Renewable Energy Society. He spent four decades as a renewable energy researcher and manager at the National Renewable Energy Lab and was the director of the Buildings and Thermal Sciences Center until July 2018. We are also pleased to welcome Lauren Swain, the coordinator of the Colorado Chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility, a national organization of health professionals and allies advocating for protection of human health and survival from the gravest environmental threats. Lauren has been working with organizations to strengthen climate, health, and safety policy in Colorado since 2012, and has served on many political campaigns. She earned a BA in filmmaking and psychology from the University of Denver, an associate of applied science and paralegal studies from Arapaho County Community College's ABA certified program. A lifelong human rights advocate, Ms. Swain also produced several multilingual cultural orientation videos for refugee resettlement programs in Colorado and Arizona. Thank you both for being here tonight. Thank you very much, Mary. It's an honor to be here with you all. Okay, seeing that okay? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you very much, Chuck. All right, take it away, Lauren. Everybody, I'm Lauren Swain. I'm coordinator for PSR Colorado. And uh, we are health professionals and allies concerned with human health and survival, responding to the gravest environmental health threats um, that we face in these times. Uh, we mobilize health professionals and allies to address the gravest environmental threats to health and survival. And one way we do that is publish national reports. These three national reports apply to our discussion here of the Excel Clean Heat Plan proceeding at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, so the first one here, which you can access online and I could provide the information later, is the Compendium on the Risks and Harms of Fracking, because unfortunately fracking is the leading way that we access methane gas or natural gas for use in our homes and other parts of our society. And it comes with many risks and harms to our health. Uh, the second um, publication, National Report, is Health Effects from Gas Stove 
pollution. And even though we're talking largely here about gas furnaces, all gas appliances uh, have the potential to leak and malfunction and release hazardous air pollutants. And um, those hazardous air pollutants from gas stoves, for example, are responsible, according to recent studies, for roughly 12% of childhood asthma in the United States. So it's a good resource for one of the worst sources of gas uh, pollution in our homes. And lastly, we have hydrogen pipe dreams. Why burning hydrogen in buildings is bad for health and climate. PSR National is very concerned about the movement towards hydrogen blending, and we'll be discussing that later. And this is a great resource to, to find out why that's not a good idea. Oh, the climate crisis is a health crisis aggravated by burning gas in homes. Uh, burning fossil fuels in buildings is responsible for about 29% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, fueling the climate crisis. And one of the worst manifestations of that is, of course, the Marshall Fire here in Colorado. We know that the climate crisis overall contributes to fire, smoke, extreme heat, droughts, and floods that harm Coloradans' health and safety. The natural gas that pi XL pipes into our homes is methane gas, a fossil fuel. Uh, methane gas leaks into the atmosphere during production, transport, and end use in our homes. And it's 86 times more damaging to the climate than carbon dioxide over a 20 year period. And this little graphic just shows you all the ways from the wellhead and stretching out across the globe, um, all the different points at which Greenhouse gases and hazardous air pollutants have an impact on people as well as accidents and other, other impacts. So, um, methane is produced by drilling and fracking. These operations emit hazardous air and water pollutants and are subject to chemical spills, fires, and explosions. Oil and gas production is responsible for about 40% of front-range ozone precursor emissions leading to asthma attacks and other serious health conditions. And as you all probably know, we have a nine county non-compliant area, an area where including Denver and Metro uh, counties where we are not compliant with federal ozone standards and where the American Lung Association has often ranked our air quality with a D or an F. So um, in response to some of these considerations and others, uh, we're very fortunate to have Colorado legislators that are concerned about these issues. And in 2021, we were fortunate enough to pass the Colorado's Clean Heat Statute, SB 264. And it's an interesting statute because, because it concerns the Public Utility Commission and the Public Utility Commission has a lot of authority over these it has authority over the details, the way that this law will manifest. There's two primary requirements of this law, but it's a balancing act where the PUC can decide which of these rules will be dominant. One of the major advancements of the Clean Heat Statute, which is groundbreaking nationally, is uh, that it requires large gas utilities to submit plans that reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 4% by 2023. Well, that was supposed to be 24, 25, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a glitch. By 2025 and 22% by 2020 compared to 2015 levels. And uh, the statute also allows utilities to raise rates by up to 2.5% to recover their costs. However, uh, the PUC has the authority to say that they could raise their costs more or that um, they do not absolutely have to meet emission standards if the cost will be too high or because of other considerations. Because the highest consideration in this law is that the results of the clean heat plans will be in the public interest. And that's the determining factor for what the Public Utilities Commission, that's the basis for the what they will rule in this proceeding. So uh, XL, Colorado's largest gas utility, submitted its plan to the PUC on August 1st of last year. And the ruling is due by May 28th of this year. This ruling will affect Colorado customers for years to come and influence standards for the other gas utilities. So uh, Black Hills, Atmos, and one or two other small, uh, relatively small gas utilities will all have to submit 
clean heat, heat plans and have done so, and uh, the PUC will be evaluating those as well. So these rulings from the PUC are going to affect our health. They're going to affect our safety, our energy costs, our comfort in our homes. It's going to affect environmental justice for those of us who are low income, for, for communities that are disproportionately impacted by pollutants, for black and brown communities the ramifications of this are much more serious. And of course, it will affect our climate future, which goes back to the cycle of all the others. Our climate future will dictate our health, safety, energy, cost, comfort, and justice in the future. So it's a cycle that um, the PUC's ruling will trigger once they rule. Even though we have uh, criticisms and concerns, uh, we, this clean heat plan proceeding presents many, many opportunities uh, for advancement. And like I said, it this is a groundbreaking national opportunity. You know, we are the first state, I believe, to have a clean heat plan of this on this order. And um, what we're really talking about here is that these solutions that are. Um, that we want included in this plan, that we want to be the leading uh, results of this plan are, are benefits for ratepayers that will give us demand side management. In other words, manage demand for gas with efficiency so that we don't need as much energy to heat our homes. And uh, largely that will, uh, we're depending mostly on beneficial electrification, which is heat pumps for heating and cooling our homes and this current plan that Excel favors includes these provisions, but it doesn't rely strongly enough on these provisions and unfortunately includes uh, what we term false solutions or ineffective strategies or dangerous schemes, however you want to put it. These are the solutions we want and we want them to benefit ratepayers and benefit our environment and our climate. So the pitfalls of Excel's clean heat plan are costly, ineffective, risky strategies that do not benefit ratepayers and raise the price of the plan. And so some of these strategies that Excel has, and Chuck will go into greater detail about, are recovered natural gas, certified natural gas, and hydrogen methane blends. We really all need to come together because Excel's clean heat plan must put health and climate first and not bill us for false solutions. That's what we're fighting for. That We want solutions that actually benefit the people who are paying extra money to get the solutions. And that means heat pumps that heat and cool our homes efficiently. Uh, and also you'll see that they uh, provide cleaner indoor air and cleaner outdoor air in the process. The dark side of Excel's plan uh, to us, really one of the very worst parts of this plan is that they are proposing that hydrogen methane blends can be used in homes to supposedly reduce emissions. Uh, hydrogen burns a tiny bit cleaner than, well, it burns a little bit cleaner than methane, but it has a lot of problems. And these problems are well understood, but how very serious they are is, are not fully understood in the context of uh, use of blending hydrogen with methane and pumping it into piping it into residence where your ordinary gas supply would be. So yeah, we got the Hindenburg there that it, <laughs> that was hydrogen uh, that exploded in the Hindenburg, and it is really a very serious problem, a risk, a higher risk than methane, which we know can catch on fire and can explode in our homes. But surprisingly, uh, hydrogen blends actually do increase a certain type of pollutant. Uh, nitrogen oxides, um, and they, they those um, emissions do cause asthma and other serious health conditions. So it does not in, burn cleaner in that regard. Hydrogen gas leaks, ignites, and explodes even more easily than the current methane gas supply. It's expensive and is largely sourced from a methane gas itself. Yes, over 90% of the hydrogen in use right now is produced from methane gas through a very energy intensive process that includes emissions. And how do they propose to address those emissions? Through, by making a gray hydrogen from methane blue through carbon capture schemes that large are seen are largely ineffective and very, very costly.
investing in hydrogen blending also takes funding away from the real solutions that we want that directly benefit ratepayers. There is no immediate, there are only risks and no immediate benefit to ratepayers when hydrogen is added to your gas supply. What are Excel's proposed recovered and certified natural gas programs? Why are they bad for health and safety? Uh, because any form of methane gas in homes is bad for health and safety. Uh, we know that burning gas releases nitrogen dioxide, particulate, particulate matter, and other hazardous air pollutants. And these pollutants increase asthma attacks, aggravate COPD, and cause and aggravate other health conditions that shorten and de degrade the quality of human life. I mean, it really is that dire, that serious. And we do have alternatives that we want and need. And if we're going to pay more, we should have them. Uh, heating with gas risks monoxide poisoning and gas appliance malfunctions, cause fires and explosions. Uh, why would you invite this into your home unless you absolutely needed to? And why would policymakers subject us to fancy forms of this gas recovered in certified natural gas that are supposedly a little bit cleaner on the front end when they're produced, but they make no difference for all these dangers that gas brings to our homes? just want to mention also that when air pollution, all of these considerations are bad enough for everybody, but if you are an, a member of a Black or Latino community, if you are uh, in a disproportionately impacted community that um, is subject to air pollution, uh, other air pollution sources such as highways, factories, and refineries, um, you're high, at higher risk for asthma and other serious health conditions that cause missed days of school and work, greater hardship for low-income communities. Low-income communities are least able to afford the cost of medication, treatment, and hospital bills due to asthma attacks. Environmental racism causes Black and Latino communities to be disproportionately exposed to air pollutants from other sources. So again, we do need to get the source, at least, of gas um, pollution out of our homes. So equitable public policy advances environmental justice and benefits for all Coloradans. Electric heat pumps improve our indoor air and our indoor and outdoor air quality and provide efficient heating and cooling to mitigate the effects of climate change. So I just cannot emphasize enough. They call it a heat pump, but it's really a heating and cooling pump. Every heat pump can deliver cooling in our increasingly hot environment that we're subject to in summer. And so it's very important to recognize that if you're choosing which way to spend extra dollars to reduce emissions, that spending those extra dollars in a way that provides cooling is the most equitable, fair, and ben beneficial way to achieve those emission reductions. We need those benefits to go to the ratepayers that are subsidizing this change. So when heating and cooling are, are made available by heat pumps, it mitigates the effect of climate change on vulnerable populations and everyone else. So your voice makes a difference. Uh, I'm happy to report that faced with opposition, uh, Excel changed its plans and took certified natural gas and carbon offsets out of its emission reduction portfolio. That means they're no longer claiming these are a source of emission reductions formally in their clean heat plan. However, unfortunately, they still want ratepayers to subsidize these ineffective strategies because they still believe that they're better than uh, or cheaper than doing things in the way that we consider to be most beneficial to the public. Uh, we were also successful in pushing Excel to delay its residential hydrogen blending demonstration project. So they had proposed to put hydrogen to uh, start hydrogen blending uh, demonstration, not testing, but really they were turning a population of Hudson, Colorado into guinea pigs to test, oh, how does it really work when we do hydrogen blending? We don't really know. So let's find out by um, having 200 homes be a pilot or demonstration project. Anyway, a lot of people objected to that, a lot of individuals and a lot of groups and our group was one of them. And there was some decent news coverage too. And we even had an ad campaign 
Um, so with all of that, they have delayed their residential demonstration project, but they still want us to pay for um, a, an inter internal demonstration project on Excel's own property. They still want to charge us more to initiate that. And they still have a long-term vision of hydrogen blending as one of their major emission reduction strategies. And I really hope that we'll be able to uh, prevent that, convince uh, PUC not to allow that to happen. So Excel submitted its plan on August 1st. The decision's due on the 28th. Public comment, please submit your comments to the PUC by April 9th and follow the instructions provided by our host, Mary, uh, so that we can all get better results from this clean heat proceeding. It's going to take all of us, but um, both the PUC and Excel are listening. And if there's enough of us saying what we want and what we don't want, I have a hope that it can make an important difference in the outcome. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. And uh, we can move on to my friend Chuck Kutcher uh, with his presentation about some of these strategies and how they work and do not. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Okay. So uh, you heard from Lauren and now you'll kind of hear from an engineer, the different uh, solutions that Excel has proposed. And, and I certainly agree with Lauren that we have to be moving toward uh, electrification. So look, uh, natural gas utilities around the country, uh, I'd say it's fair to say they view building electrification as a threat to their business. Uh, this particular article says uh, Excel's played a leading role in a plan to defend natural gas in Colorado. So that's kind of what's going around, uh, on, not just with the Excel gas utility, again, but with other gas utilities as well. Another a CPR article made the point that projects to expand or maintain the natural gas network have been a reliable source of re revenue for the comp company, which reported a record $1.77 billion in earnings in 2023. So really what's behind this is, uh, you know, not only electricity, but the natural gas system is also a, a profit center for Excel. And if you look at their uh, clean heat plan, at least in the early version of it, they showed projections of retail gas sales out to mid-century. Uh, and you can see even the lowest one here, the red curve, results in only 14% less natural gas being consumed in mid-century than today. And, and please note the y-axis on that graph doesn't go to zero. It's sort of blown up at the top part. So uh, really not seeing much of a decline in natural gas use. And you know, the gas industry has talked about uh, natural gas as being a, a clean thermal fuel. They've used the term clean molecules. And by that, they mean kind of using these different things uh, of which uh, Lawrence already uh, uh, mentioned them. Uh, but I'll go into a little bit more detail of, of certified natural gas, carbon offsets, recovered methane, and blending hydrogen with natural gas or, or methane. So certified natural gas so the idea is, uh, you know, I think environmental organizations have rightfully pointed out uh, that the whole natural gas system has leaks in it. Uh, it's been estimated in Colorado, it's about 2.4% leakage overall. Uh, and methane itself is a, a strong greenhouse gas. However, it's only up in the atmosphere for 11 or 12 years, um, and unlike CO2, which is up there for centuries, basically. Uh, but nevertheless, it is a strong greenhouse gas, and it makes sense to reduce leaks. Um, and so organizations have come out and said, hey, we'll, we'll go measure leaks, we'll certify them, and you can you know, provide your customers with, with methane gas that has been certified to, to have a very low leakage level. Uh, well, this organization Earthworks went out and, and did some tests. Um, there's various ways these organizations measure leaks, but a, a major way to do it is with what are called continuous emissions monitors. Um, and basically what the Earthworks experts did, they're trained in optical gas imaging, and they went out with these imaging cameras, uh, and they discovered a lot of leaks that had been missed by the continuous emission monitors. So it's a good thing to reduce leaks. It's not clear uh, how successful it's going to be. So certification... Certification can certainly uh, miss upstream leaks, and certainly it's not measuring, you know, leaks in the neighborhood or distribution system for natural gas. 
And of course, it does nothing for the carbon dioxide that gets emitted when you burn the gas. So look, the bottom line is certified natural gas, it's just natural gas is what it is, uh, with somewhat less upstream leakage. And then the question is, shouldn't we have always had methane gas without upstream leaks? Isn't this something the gas industry uh, should have dealt with uh, before this clean heat plan? All right, carbon offsets. Uh, you might have seen that John Oliver had a show on this. It was He did a pretty good job, I think, of, of pointing out the issues with it. So the, the basic idea, of course, is that uh, it, you, you burn carbon, but you buy offsets from someone else who's reducing carbon. And a typical way to do that is to invest uh, in, in uh, afforestation, new forests uh, are being planted. Um, of course, it takes a while for those forests to grow. And, and another issue is you have to know if there's really additionality. In other words, whatever you're buying the offsets for, would that have happened anyway? And that's that's a key issue. And so various studies have looked at these carbon offsets and come away not very convinced that they're very effective. Uh, this one study by a Stanford researcher looked at 300 carbon offset projects um, and found that they uh, consistently uh, over over uh, valued the amount of carbon that was saved. So carbon offsets are often greatly exaggerated, and look, they're they're no substitute for reducing emissions at their source. Another one is recovered methane. It, you have various places where methane leaks. It can be in dairies. Uh, in this particular case, it's it's coal bed methane, and so Excel has mentioned uh, one of the things they will do is capture this recovered methane and therefore prevent those leaks uh, that get into the atmosphere and, and, and cause the greenhouse gas effects of the leaked methane. However, one of the things they've touted is this uh, uh, ute reservation uh, that uh, uses coal bed methane. And really, if you look at how much methane they could get at capture out of that, it would be a tenth of a percent of the amount of residential gas that Excel sells. So it's really a drop in the bucket. And if you look at their testimony, the total recovered methane in the state might be 2% of the residential gas supply. The other issue is in general, when you recover this methane, it can be mixed in with carbon dioxide, other gases, and you have to treat it. You have to process it. And so it winds up being quite expensive. Uh, by one Excel estimate, it can be up to three times the current natural gas cost. Um, I've seen a, a natural gas industry study that basically said it can be five times the cost by the time you finish treating it, uh, compressing it, distributing it. So recovered methane is very limited in supply. It's very expensive um, and it will only get more expensive. The other thing I wanna mention is there was an effort uh, in Wyoming to recover coal bed methane. Um, what they found was they wound up with a lot of uh, uh, processed water um, that they had to use to get that methane out, uh, and that wound up uh, contaminating surface water. So um, there could be real environmental impacts of trying to recover coal bed methane. And as a result, they, uh, they stopped doing that in Wyoming. I don't know if they, uh, the latest I've seen is they haven't picked it up. I'm not sure of that. All right, so then it gets to hydrogen. So as gas utilities are promoting hydrogen, but it could be a dead end for consumers and the climate, and that's certainly uh, certainly what we think. Um, so this Excel had planned on blending hydrogen into the natural gas system serving neighborhood in uh, uh, near Hudson, uh, north of Denver. Uh, Lauren mentioned the concerns about having hydrogen in your home. Um, it, it basically has a much broader um, uh, flammability range than natural gas does. It is more likely uh, uh, to ignite, for example, and it's extremely leaky being the smallest molecule. So Excel has delayed this demonstration project because of all the, uh, uh, the outpouring of concern from people in the neighborhood and from various organizations, uh, but, it, but it hasn't uh, given up on hydrogen altogether. Now, if you mix hydrogen with natural gas, one of the problems you have is that uh, gas pipelines, uh, furnaces, et cetera, are all designed for basically uh, 
pure natural gas, which is uh, predominantly methane gas. It's not made for hydrogen. And hydrogen not only leaks, but it can cause what's called hydrogen embroilment. And, and so in general, there's arguments out there. You can read different things in the literature. How much hydrogen can you safely mix with uh, natural gas before you start having problems with piping, uh, furnaces, et cetera? And Excel basically decided, well, they'll, they'll go as high as a 10% hydrogen mix. Hydrogen by volume has about one third the energy content of natural gas. And so when you mix 10% hydrogen in with natural gas, you've only reduced uh, carbon dioxide emissions by 3%. Uh, and, and also Excel in their plans talks about using blue hydrogen. If you use blue hydrogen, that would actually result in more emissions than just burning the natural gas according to a study by Stanford and Cornell researchers. Uh, blue hydrogen is basically the, the commercial hydrogen that's produced today from methane gas. It's called steam methane reforming, uh, but you capture and sequester the carbon dioxide. Um, but again, studies have shown uh, that that really doesn't help much in terms of carbon emissions and actually is a little bit worse than burning natural gas. Now, you might say, well, okay, um, you don't get much benefit from, from putting in a small percent of hydrogen, uh, but what if we used pure hydrogen? And not only we use pure hydrogen, but we use green hydrogen. That's hydrogen that's produced from wind and solar electricity by running an electrolyzer, splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, well, people have uh, come up with the idea of pushing that in, in Europe. And there are 37 independent studies, totally independent from different organizations that have concluded hydrogen is not gonna play any significant role in building heating. And, and I'll show you why in this diagram. Uh, basically green hydrogen, again, comes from electrolysis of water. You're splitting the hydrogen from the oxygen. And so the top graph shows using hydrogen that would go to a hydrogen furnace Hydrogen furnace doesn't exist, by the way. We'd have to develop hydrogen furnaces that are compatible with 100% hydrogen. Uh, but bear, bear with me for a moment and say we have a hydrogen furnace in this house in the upper right. You use electricity from wind and solar. You split water. Uh, you compress it. Uh, you store it. Uh, you provide it to a furnace. When you look at all the efficiencies in that, you start with 100 watts of electricity and you wind up with 60 watts of heating. On the other hand, if you use that 100 watts of electricity and run a heat pump, uh, you can get up to 270 watts of heating. Why is that? Because a heat pump doesn't create heat. It just moves heat from one place to another with essentially an efficiency that's much greater than 100%. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So if you use green hydrogen to heat homes in Colorado, that will require three times as much electricity as using heat pumps, uh, roughly. Um, that's a lot of electricity, and we're, we're already having to see our grid grow to handle data centers, uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, mines, uh, and, and AI uh, uh, generation. And so we're already looking at a big growth of the electric grid. We have to convert it to wind and solar. Uh, boy, if we produce hydrogen now, uh, that, would, that would require an enormous amount more electricity. Uh, DOE has stated none of their roadmaps uh, consider home heating as a viable use of hydrogen. Uh, and also, and I think uh, Lauren mentioned this, uh, hydrogen combustion produces uh, basically nitrogen oxide emissions, and it's very leak prone. And when hydrogen leaks, it's not directly a greenhouse gas, but indirectly, it has the impact of 30 times as much as carbon dioxide. So look, the right solution is to rapidly electrify buildings. And we're in a great situation in Colorado because of what Excel is doing on their electricity grid. Basically, they're looking at just over the next six years, reaching somewhere between 80 and 85% of their electricity from solar and wind. Solar and wind, in terms of new generation, solar and wind are now the cheapest forms of electricity that you can buy. In fact, the, the, the uh, International Energy Agency has declared that solar energy is the cheapest electricity in history. And so the great news is our grid is getting very, very clean, very rapidly. Okay, so let's use that clean electricity to run battery electric cars and run heat pumps at homes. 
That's how we can address climate change and air pollution emissions simultaneously. Uh, and so this is uh, basically an article saying Excel's latest climate plan sparks a heated fight over heat pumps. Prior to releasing their clean heat plan last August, uh, Excel was involved in an interview and various articles that raised doubts about the performance of heat pumps in Colorado. Uh, this is a quote from Excel, and I, I just highlighted the portion of it where they say, natural gas can provide heat even on the coldest days of the year. And, and they've also said that they, you know, uh, and they say heat pumps work well in the spring and the fall, implying that maybe you can't depend on them in the wintertime. And, and that's just not really accurate. So heat pumps have worked well in the, the coldest times of Colorado. There are heat pumps in Fraser, Colorado. Heat pumps have uh, really uh, be, uh, been installed uh, in Maine. Uh, they've installed over 100,000 heat pumps in homes in Maine, and they're on track uh, to install over 300,000. Um, and of course, Maine is, doesn't have that big a population. That's a lot of heat pumps. Now, Maine ha does have a significant advantage over us economically, and that is most of the homes in Maine are heated with oil, which is quite a bit more expensive than natural gas. So they have even a bigger economic benefit. Uh, but of course, they also have the benefit of eliminating air pollution and climate change impacts. Okay, so about two years ago, I electrified our own home. Um, you can see the heat pump in the uh, two photos at the top. Uh, this is a Mitsubishi three-ton heat pump. That means it's 36,000 BTUs for an hour. Uh, there's the outdoor unit on the top. There's the indoor unit in an air handler uh, on, the, uh, on the right. Um, and so this, uh, this is a ducted system. You can buy mini splits where you have units in various rooms. Um, in this case, it just uh, the, the warm air from the heat pump feeds into the existing ductwork. Um, I live in a 1960s era home in, in, in Applewood. Uh, the lower left is a heat pump water heater. In the right, we replaced our electric stove with an induction stove, uh, induction stove top. Uh, so let me just point out, uh, this past winter was not as cold as the previous winter. The previous winter, uh, we hit temperatures uh, two days in a row of minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and you can see, if you look in the upper right here, you can see that uh, right here, I have what's a, a 10 kilowatt, you can't see it, it's inside this unit, a 10 kilowatt electric resistance heater. Um, and basically, I can turn that on if the heat pump doesn't provide enough heat. But this here is a disconnect switch, and it has always been in the off position. So even when it was 15 degrees below zero outside, without any auxiliary resistance heat, I was heating our homes to our home to 69, 70 degrees Fahrenheit with just the heat pump. So it can work very, very well as long as you get a cold climate heat pump, a modern cold climate heat pump. I also wanted to point out that the uh, uh, New Buildings Institute did a study and, and they found that in, in many cases in new buildings, um, the, the installation cost of going all electric is cheaper than going with gas. In other words, you save all the gas appliances and you save uh, all the gas piping. Um, and in particular, in new buildings, uh, particularly in new neighborhoods, um, if you go with ground coupled heat pumps, uh, where instead of extracting the heat from the outside air in the winter, uh, they extract the heat from the ground uh, uh, in the winter, the ground temperature in the winter in Colorado is somewhere between 50 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit, typically much, much warmer than the outside air. So ground coupled heat pumps are very, very efficient. Um, and I'll show you an example here. If you, you, you can rate a heat pump by its coefficient of performance, and it's a function of the outdoor temperature, uh, assuming your indoor temperature stays steady at 70 degrees. Uh, the lower the outdoor temperature, the lower the coefficient of performance. It's sort of a way to measure efficiency. If you look at an average overheating system in the Denver metro area, an air-to-air -air heat pump like the one that I have, will provide two and a half kilowatt hours of heating for every kilowatt hour of electricity it consumes. A ground coupled heat pump, on the other hand, where you, you, you drill boreholes, they can be several hundred feet deep. Uh, you communicate with the ground, you send water into the ground, you warm the water with the ground, and that becomes the source for the heat pump instead of the outside air. In that case, you can get four kilowatt hours or more of heat for every kilowatt hour of electricity consumed. So they're very, very efficient. Um, and I'll also point out, uh, uh, particularly with this ground-coupled heat pump, 
not only they are more efficient for heating in the winter, they're much more efficient for, for cooling in the summer because now they're not trying to reject heat to 90 degree outside air. They're trying to reject heat to 55 degree Fahrenheit ground. So they're, they're better all around. They save you a lot of energy. Uh, the other thing they do is one of the concerns we have as we electrify homes is that Excel, which is now a summer peaking utility, they, their, their peaks tend to occur when people are running air conditioning loads on hot summer afternoons. What's gonna happen is we electrify homes with heat pumps on those very, very cold winter days, that's when they're gonna see their peak electricity demand. They, they'll eventually become a winter peaking utility. To reduce that peak in the amount of new generation they have to uh, build, the more we can use ground coupled heat pumps, the better off we are. Because when it drops to 15 below zero outside, guess what? The ground temperature just is still 50 or 55 degrees. So it doesn't see that big spike uh, in the winter heating demand. Anyway, that's all I have. And uh, uh, we're, Lauren and I uh, will be very, very happy to answer your questions. Uh, we'll stay a little bit after seven if, you, if it goes beyond that. You can see my email address there if you have any questions for me. Uh, fail, uh, feel free to send me an email and, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Chris Hoffman with Empower Our Future. We already have some questions in the Q&A. Uh, first one is, do uh, ground source heat pumps cool? And I think, Chuck, you just answered that in the, the last yeah. presentation. Um, here's a comment. Um, last summer, I removed the gas forced air furnace from my 1972 home and installed an air source heat pump. Even during the negative temperatures in January, my house was toasty warm, which aligns with what you were saying. I no longer need a carbon monoxide detector, and I now have air conditioning, which I didn't used to need, but now will be nice, especially in those frequent ozone days. And I have solar panels to provide the energy. Well, good for you. That is great. Uh, another couple of questions that have come up. Um, uh, first off, uh, for... Um, for Lauren, one of your slides, I th I think could uh, I were interested in a little bit more clarification on it was uh, your slide about the uh, utility Excel. Uh, it's the one about face with opposition. Excel took certified natural gas and carbon offsets out of its emissions reduction portfolio and delayed its residential hydrogen blending demonstration project twice. But it says Excel is still asking the PUC for approval to make ratepayers subsidize these ineffective strategies. And I think you went into that briefly, uh, why that is so. But I think on the, on the face of it, it's, it's a little confusing why they took it out, but they're still asking us to pay for it. So Lauren, could you clarify that? Well, sure. There's a couple different parts of uh, Excel's preferred plan, which now they're calling their flex plan. They've had a couple. They've had essentially uh, three iterations of what you know the plan that they they say they don't prefer any. They they have a plan that meets the cost target. I talked about the cost target being two point five percent increase in rates. They have a plan that meets the emissions target. Um, including uh, including one that uh, meets it with all electricity. But the plan that they want to push, the, their preferred plan right now um, does not claim that certified natural gas or offsets um, will be responsible for the emission reductions that they claim. And so when they removed, I don't know if that makes sense. They still want us to pay for it they still think these things remove emissions, but they have acceded to us that they're not going to formally claim that these uh, will be responsible for their emission reductions. And therefore, their, their current plan doesn't meet their target. It doesn't meet the emissions reduction target because they can't, they don't want to, they're not, they decide, well, we're just not going to claim that to meet the target anymore. We'll, uh, accede to your claims that it's not going to help meet the target, but you still should pay for it because it really, you know, it's equivocation, plain and simple. Or are they essentially asking us to pay for a pilot project or an experimental project for them? 
Well, in the case of the hydrogen uh, demonstration project, yes. In the case of certified natural gas, no, it's not a pilot. I mean, it will start slowly because they still are not firm in how they're going to source the certified natural gas. They're not firm. They're not claim. They do not have a plan to source their renewable natural, their recovered natural gas. They're still figuring these things out. So in a sense, it is a pilot, but they're not, they're not calling it that. They still say that these are going to provide a, a, a great emission reduction, you know, help meet the goals, even though formally they're not claiming that they will. So okay. it's speculation on their part. I think the PUC has a huge amount of discretion, but also Excel appears to have a huge amount of discretion in what they can ask for in the context of this plan. So th thank you very much for that. And it, I think that goes back to your plea for all viewers to contact the Public Utilities Commission and make their opinions known. We have another question or a comment and a question. Thanks for the great presentation. This is for both of you. What recommendations would you like to see in the final statements of position in the Clean Heat Plan? The City of Boulder has asked us, Empower Our Future, for recommendations and feel free to answer over the next few days or now if you have anything you wanna say. Um, well, we covered, uh, first of all, uh, we're not in a position to say what anybody else should put in their statement of position because uh, both PSR Colorado and Colorado Renewable Energy Society are uh, co-interveners in the proceeding. And that means that if we communicate with other uh, co-interveners, it has to be done through attorneys. Um, but, you know, the general recommendations, not for any one state of position, uh, statement of position, but just general recommendations uh, mirror what we have said here, uh, that we don't re want reliance on um, on false solutions, or I'm trying to come up I, with a term that doesn't even include the word solution, like ineffective schemes or dangerous schemes, <laughs> risky schemes. We don't want uh, ratepayers to be asked to pay for that. We don't want them included in a plan that is supposed to clean up our, um, protect our climate and clean up our indoor and outdoor air. Uh, so those, um, you know, the, the hydrogen, the renewable, the recovered natural gas, the certified natural gas um, don't belong in this plan. And then um, we want the plan to rely on beneficial electrification with uh, whatever it takes to make these, to improve adoption and make uh, heat pumps are accessible to everyone. Okay, next questions. Um, two questions here actually. One is why focus advocacy on air source heat pumps given the higher efficiency of ground source? And then the second question is, are you concerned about the increased electricity demand due to mass switching to heat pumps and especially the uh, air source heat pumps. Chuck? Yeah, I can answer that. Uh, look, uh, so the issue is ground coupled heat pumps are terrific. Um, you know, we ha as examples, uh, there's a, a, a ground coupled, sometimes people call them geothermal system on the state capitol, uh, on uh, the Moby Arena at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, at Colorado College, um, and uh, at Colorado Mesa University, uh, unfortunately, not at CU Boulder. It's something I've been advocating. Uh, we'll see if we see it someday. But in any case, you know, for large buildings, campuses, that sort of thing, uh, new neighborhoods, uh, uh, ground coupled heat pumps are fantastic. Uh, the problem is you have to drill deep wells, and that means bringing a large drilling rig on the site. Um, and so it's hard to do it for retrofitting homes because, you know, you have gardens in the way, fences in the way. Uh, it can be very disruptive to the land to come in and, and drill boreholes. These are boreholes that are, that are several hundred feet deep. Um, so basically, and if you're just doing a single home, you might only have like two boreholes, say, uh, for that home. Uh, whereas if you do a new neighborhood, you have hundreds of boreholes or a campus or something. And so you're really amortizing the cost of getting that rig to the site, the daily cost of using that drilling rig, et cetera. So uh, ground coupled heat pumps, I would say, 
you know, you might inst you might get uh, install an air source heat pump like in my house for about fifteen thousand uh, dollars. It would be more than twice that much, pro likely, uh, if you installed a ground coupled heat pump. So generally, when we have people retrofitting uh, heat pumps in existing homes, electrifying existing homes, they're going with air source heat pumps because of the high cost premium for ground coupled. Um, now, and, and it was also a good question that if we have lots of air source heat pumps, um, you know, isn't that gonna, on these cold winter days, um, isn't that gonna mean we, we uh, have more electricity needs? You know, that's true. Uh, but for example, let's say we change time of use rates and we charge electric vehicles during the day. Uh, a typical electric vehicle like the one I have has a battery the size of six Tesla power walls. Um, if those batteries, uh, you know, can be charged uh, during the day uh, and then provide uh, some electricity during cold winter nights, they can somewhat ameliorate uh, that demand. Uh, but yes, uh, there's no question that compared to ground coupled heat pumps, uh, air source heat pumps will require more electric generation and re uh, and result in uh, you know steeper winter peaks. Great, thank you. Uh, and related cost, you mentioned the cost of what you paid for air source heat pump. The next one of the questions is, what is the cost of a ground heat pump, including installation, compared with an air heat pump like a Mitsubishi Diamond? So, I mean, again, probably for a home, you might be talking thirty, forty thousand dollars. You know, I don't know. I haven't gotten any quotes on ground coupled heat pumps for an individual home, uh, but again, you're you're probably talking at least twice, maybe two and a half uh, times the cost of installing a uh, a, uh, a, a an air source heat pump. I, I testified for uh, an appliance bill at the state capitol last week that's incentivizing um, uh, new heat pumps. And one of the things I liked about the bill uh, was that it was giving a larger uh, tax incentive for ground coupled heat pumps than for air source heat pumps, because they do have that greater value of using fewer kilowatt hours a year and also resulting in a lower peak demand compared to air source heat pumps. So this bill would give them a higher in tax incentive. It's still probably not enough uh, to expect a lot of people are going to be putting ground coupled heat pumps on individual homes, but if we can get them to put them on, on large new office buildings, college campuses, uh, new neighborhoods. Um, and you know, the, I think one of the last, the last slide I showed in my presentation, um, and I don't know if you're uh, just putting the uh, YouTube video on your site or the slides, but I'm happy to provide a copy of my slides to get posted on the site. Uh, but that's an example where Massachusetts is promoting ground coupled heat pumps and also promoting it uh, promoting them as a new business model uh, for utilities. So utilities that make money uh, putting gas piping in new neighborhoods can make the, their money by putting water piping for ground couple T pumps in new neighborhoods. And I think that's a, a great way to pursue it. Thank you very much. And just one clarification came in on the chat. Um, just, just to confirm, air source heat pumps are still more efficient than tr traditional resistance heaters. Uh, electric heaters. So. Yeah, I mean, you remember that, uh, you know, I showed what's called the COP or coefficient of performance. Uh, they can't call it efficiency because it's the number greater than one. But again, you know, averaged over a whole winter season, my heat pump probably provides about two and a half kilowatt hours uh, of heat uh, for every uh, kilowatt hour of electricity. Now, if you plug an electric resistance heater into an outlet or you're in an older home that's heated with electric resistance heating, that's a coefficient of performance of one, essentially. You put a kilowatt hour of electricity in, you get one kilo, kilowatt hour of heat out. So air source heat pumps give you, you know, two and a half times as much energy on average as an electric resistance heater. Ground coupled heat pumps give you four times or more. Thank you. And I see we're just at the uh, seven o'clock hour. And uh, again, I want to thank both of you for your presentation and for being willing to stay on after the uh, after the hour. So we'll be moving to Empower Hour after hours. And Mary may have a couple of 
comments before we move into that segment. And then uh, Steve Whitaker, another member of our team, will be handling the Q&A for the Empower Hour after hours. So Mary, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you both, Lauren and uh, uh I'm sorry, I didn't ask if I could call you Chuck or not, but Dr. Kutcher and you, Chuck. <laughs> Wayne, uh, we sure appreciate you being here. Very important and, and interesting information. Um, I'm just going to take a moment to say thank you to the other Empower Our Future communication team members. Uh, they are integral to making these Empower Hours happen. Paul Cullinan, Chris Hoffman, Steve Whitaker, and Julie Zonizer. Yeah, Great, thank you, Mary, and I'll continue with some of the questions. Uh, one could, here that's in the that, chat is, um, is are there specific types of comments, questions, or requests from the average non-scientist Colorado ratepayer that would be especially valuable, effective testimony for the PUC? So I think either of you could, or both of you could respond to that. Well, again, I mean, the basic argument I would make is uh, good job, Excel. Um, you know, you're doing a great job decarbonizing the grid with solar and wind. Uh, pretty soon we're going to have, you know, basically 80, 85 percent carbon free electricity. So let's use that electricity. Uh, let's get off gasoline for, for cars. We have now battery electric vehicles that are approaching gasoline vehicles in first cost uh, and uh and certainly are ahead of gasoline vehicles in total ownership cost in terms of energy and, and maintenance. And then in terms of homes, um, yes, uh, let's get off gas because that, that gets rid of uh, gas pollution, both indoor and outdoor pollution. And many, many studies recently have shown uh, what the impact of a gas stove is, particularly on children in terms of, of, of indoor pollution. And of course, there's a great deal of out, outdoor pollution and it's the climate change issue. If we want to get serious about climate change, uh, we have to stop burning fossil fuels. It's as simple as that. Great, Lauren, and, do you want to and add we're taking, And we're taking advantage of the fact that we now have these incredible cold climate heat pumps. I mean, the, this performance that you're seeing for heat pumps is something new in the last 10 or 15 years or so uh, that they've gotten so incredibly efficient. And that's really good news. Lauren, anything you'd like to add? Um, I would just want to, it's really important to make comments of any kind, informed comments that show that you know the issues. Um, I, I can't say for sure what Excel will be most responsive to, but I think that, you know, if you watch, if you look at the slides, if you watch this again, if you've taken notes, if something stood out for you, uh, whatever the take home message is for you, what do you want? What do you not want? If you're aware of what the issues are, they um, and, and, and you get other people, especially more than anything, I think is to submit comments and tell a friend, tell a family member to submit comments as well. And even if they're just copying what you said and putting it in their own words, you know, the more people that are that they know are aware of this. I believe the more successful we're going to be, um, because they're hearing every day from the utilities. They are too close to the utilities. The Public Utilities Commission rubs shoulders with utilities all the time. They know them. They hear from them. They have conversations with them all the time, and not with us. So the most important thing is to show up with your comments and get other people there and show that you know what you're talking about. Um, nothing, there's no substitute for that. And, and I don't, I think you could pick any, any topics and just the idea is that they need to hear from you. Yeah, there's a couple of points I'd like to make. You know, I think when I went through my presentation, I pointed out the, the high cost of uh, recovered methane um, the fact that offsets really uh, don't work reliably at all. Um, but it's also important to know that there is a cost of building electrification. So I mentioned it cost me $15,000 to, uh, you know, install my heat pump system. 
I, I had an old furnace, uh, an old carrier that was, I think, 21 years old. And pretty soon I would have to replace that furnace. And, you know, I avoided that furnace replacement cost. Um, one thing people are pushing for is, is when you have uh, reached the end of life of a central air conditioner, that instead of replacing it with another central air conditioner, you replace it with a heat pump. And when they do that, you should really use a cold climate heat pump, and then you can get completely off natural gas. By being completely off natural gas, I save the gas hookup charge, which might be something approaching $200 a year. I save that cost. Um, but it, one of the issues is there's the installation cost. And, you know, the, the city of Crested Butte, starting in January 1st, uh, you know, required... Uh, you know, that new buildings uh, use be all electric. And so I think we'll develop a, a, a more competitive heat pump industry once pretty much it's expected that new buildings have to be uh, heated electrically. And that'll bring down the installation costs. There's still the operating costs, okay? And I mentioned that in Maine, they're selling like gangbusters because they're replacing the expensive oil that you burn in oil furnaces. One of the challenges we have in Colorado is natural gas is pretty darn cheap. Um, you know, Excel buys wind and solar electricity at four and five cents a kilowatt hour, but it, when it adds on all the various costs of distribution, transmission, whatever, you know, residential rates are more like 15 cents. Um, so it winds up the electricity is maybe four times the cost of natural gas. Now, Excel in their economic models are supposed to include the social cost of carbon. If they include the latest social cost of carbon, $190 per ton from the EPA, that essentially doubles the residential cost of natural gas. And, and it, economically, uh, it makes the heat pumps uh, uh, pencil out. Uh, but in the meantime, we have to look for ways uh, to keep people from seeing their heat bills go up if they switch from burning cheap natural gas to running an electric heat pump as efficient as a heat pump is. And that means bundling energy efficiency measures with heat pump installations. Uh, it can mean installing rooftop PV that's maybe financed over a 20 year period or so. So there's various things we can do um, to avoid uh, the increase in heating bills. And that's one of the reasons to use ground coupled heat pumps in large new buildings and neighborhoods because of their high COP um, they can they can be cost effective even compared to cheap natural gas. Sorry, I know that was a long-winded explanation of the cost, but I think it's important that people be aware of it. Great, thank you, Chuck. Um, we have another question that's focused on cost, and the question is: How do the costs of electrification compare to the costs of hydrogen blending? The latter would be leveraged everyone who heats their homes, not just the ones who invest the capital for a new heat pumps. So it could be much more effective. And how would Excel's plan encourage electrification subsidies? So only the upper classes would be able to make use of them? Well, I mean, look, I mean, I think it's important that uh, the way incentives are done uh, that they only benefit people with high incomes, okay? Um, I think it's important to do incentives that way. Uh, there are a lot of low-income uh, programs uh, where they have special incentives for people in lower-income brackets. Um, I would say, again, hydrogen makes sense in no case. It doesn't make sense to blend it. Uh, it doesn't make sense to use 100% hydrogen. Uh, the, only, the only hydrogen that would make any sense is green hydrogen. That would require three times as much electricity as heat pumps, or at least two and a half times. Um, and a green hydrogen would be very, very expensive. Um, and so green hydrogen, just as you know, I pointed out those, what is it, 35 studies in Europe or something that looked at hydrogen for heating. Uh, doesn't make any sense to use pure hydrogen, uh, even if there was a, such a thing as a, a compatible hydrogen furnace and compatible piping. Um, and when you're limited to blends, again, you, you make a 10% blend, you're only reducing greenhouse gases by, uh, by 3%. You, you're, it's, it's not making much of an impact on climate change. If your purpose is to address climate change, hydrogen is not the answer. Lord, did you want to comment on uh, low-income programs in this regard? 
Uh, yes, it's a topic that we haven't gotten into, but um, Excel's clean heat plan is very deficient in uh, specifics on low income programs. And one of their pilots is to uh, do a demonstration retrofit on 100 single family homes, um, but there's no multifamily homes included in their programming. And uh, that's a big deficit as well. So if you want to have robust programs for uh, what they call income qualified and disproportionately impacted communities, that is another thing that um, you know all of us can make the case for because they have not fleshed out uh, their plans. And uh, I really do encourage anyone who has the time to read uh, Excel's plans <laughs> because they really are very vague. They're vague about a lot of things. And so it worries me uh, to see any approval for any of it, honestly. <laughs> you know, we need to have uh, the beneficial electrification component go forward ASAP. Um, all the other things are, you know, I, I just encourage anyone who can to scrutinize all those details. But if you want more programs that uh, make heat pumps accessible to income qualified and disproportionately impacted people um, ask for them uh, because it's completely doable. All the incentives have not been worked out. You know, there's no, it, everything can change. Everything is subject to change and influence. Great. Thank you, Lauren. So we have a question here from the chat. Uh, the cost to electrify in the clean heat plan is for Excel rebates and this seems to drive the price of the CHP past the 2.5% cap. Any thoughts about how to pay for electrifying everything? Well, I mean, one thing is that, and that people are pushing for um, is, look, uh, government programs should incentivize good things and decentivize bad things, right? And look, you burn natural gas, uh, you know, people were enamored with natural gas because it looks so much better than coal. Uh, but coal is, is just about died out, uh, close to dying out in Colorado. Um, and when you take a hard look at, at natural gas, it produces lots of uh, uh, emissions uh, in terms of air pollution and climate, climate change emissions, carbon dioxide and, and methane leaks. So we should incentivize electricity. And so one thing we need to do is basically transfer the, the costs from electricity to natural gas. So natural gas costs should go up to pay for this transition. Um, you know, like, again, uh, there's a lot of markups uh, that get added to the Euroelectric bill. I think we have to look for ways uh, to reduce those costs and maybe shift some of them onto natural gas. Okay. Uh, next question. What are your recommend what recommendations do you have to level the playing field between the cost of methane and heat pumps? Perhaps increase the social cost of carbon of methane by a factor of 5x or more to recognize the true cost of CO2 emissions? Okay, well, yeah, I, I addressed that to a certain extent. So look, the social cost of carbon uh, from the from the EPA has gone up to $190 per metric ton. A metric ton is, you know, 1,000 kilograms. Uh, it's 10% larger than a typical ton. Um, and when you account for that, basically the residential, if you add that to the residential cost of natural gas, uh, it would go from like a dollar a therm to two dollars a therm. So it essentially doubles the cost of natural gas. Um, and you know that can make not only, certainly ground coupled heat pumps then become very cost effective. Uh, and uh, uh, and and even air source heat pumps become cost effective if you do that. Now, Excel is supposed to include that in their economic analysis, uh, but you know there's no tax on carbon and there are, uh, there are groups out there that are working hard to, to put a tax on carbon, which makes a lot of sense. And if you put a tax on carbon, 
um, that's similar, uh, close to that $190 a ton number, that would really change the economics of heat pumps versus cheap natural gas. Great. So let's see, I have uh, one comment in here that, um, that says that they were involved or are knowledgeable about a retrofit um, to convert to ground source heat pumps. And for a 6,000 square foot house, got a bid of, let's see, looks like about nine, $90,000 to retrofit. Another one for $80,000 for a 2,400 square foot house. So comments don't, you know, it's. Well, my um, first comment would see would be get more bids. Um, <laughs> those seem especially high. I would expect a number somewhere, you know, a, a small home could be 30 to 40,000. A larger home might be upwards of 50,000. Those numbers sound really high to me. Uh, but as I said, the issue is that retrofitting uh, ground coupled heat pumps to existing homes is an expensive proposition. It's certainly, uh, um, you know, it's for someone that can afford it and someone that wants to have the most efficient uh, electric heating system. Go right I want to comment that uh, just as it's true with new homes that um, ground coupled heat pumps make a lot of sense. And I could almost see like, Really, I'd like to see that required for new homes because that's when it is very economical when you have a lot of homes and when you don't have a lot of infrastructure around, that's when it makes the most sense to go ground coupled. Um, but uh, I do have a friend who would, uh, who does install um, ground coupled heat pumps and he's, he's encouraging people to find, you know, talk to their neighbors because if you get it is the cost of that rig to drill those boreholes that's one of the major costs. And so if you have several people in a neighborhood or if you have a project going on in your neighborhood, I've even proposed the idea that when they replace water supply lines in Denver, that they're already digging in the ground. What if uh, cities themselves, when they're changing out um, supply lines or uh, electric lines or... <laughs> Excel itself, you know, <laughs> they could put ground coupled heat pumps in whenever there's a lot of digging going on, possibly, you know, so whatever it takes to raise that scale, the economy of scale to get ground coupled in, whether it's you and your neighbors, um, new neighborhoods or, or various projects, it's something to think about. I just want to plant the seed. Great. And, and Lauren, while you're, while you're at it, um, maybe you'd like to comment a little bit on the uh, on the bill. Yes, uh, there's a really important bill in the legislature right now. Uh, the short name for it is the Affordable, uh, Affordable Healthy Appliances Bill. It's HB 24-1352. And this bill would do a lot of things, uh, but it would... Uh, require starting in 2027 that whenever a central air conditioning system is replaced or installed, whether in new construction or a new system or a replacement system, that the air conditioning unit will be essentially a heat pump. In other words, it won't just be a cooling unit, but we'll have a switch to reverse the flow of, uh, of, of air to um, heat the home in the winter as well as cool it in the summer. So, uh, and then as Chuck mentioned, it includes incentives for those uh, heat pumps that would replace central air conditioning systems. Uh, if they are uh, cold climate heat pumps or ground source heat, heat pumps, um, there will be an additional incentive to support that. And across the board, uh, there will be a study to see how much more it would cost maybe a thousand dollars or something like that, how much more it would cost for, to install a heat pump uh, to replace a central air conditioning unit or how much more it would cost versus um, putting in a new central air conditioning system. So it's really an exciting prospect. Um, it, it, you know, the funding is there to make it easier and it just prevents the wasteful installation of air conditioners when they could be also providing heat. So ultimately it saves uh, consumers 
a lot of money um, on their next furnace. And it um, helps ensure that more homes will be moving in this direction. They will be electrifying. They won't be reliant on burning gas. Let, let me uh, let me uh, make a point about that, and that is the the interest in <clears throat> replacing central air conditioners at their end of life. Uh, part of that is to address a challenge that we have in electrifying homes, and that is to reduce the installation cost of the heat pump. Ideally, you want to do it at a time when you're avoiding putting in another gas furnace that, to replace a gas furnace that has failed, for example. Uh, well, guess what? Uh, when gas furnaces fail, they don't fail in July. They fail on the coldest day in January. <laughs> and when they fail, people want heat and they want it now. Um, and, and so uh, it's it's very difficult to time um, you know, a heat pump installation when a gas furnace has failed. Uh, it's the same thing with a uh, gas hot water heater. When the gas hot water heater fails, uh, you might say, well, gee, I want to put in a heat pump water heater, but I need it tomorrow morning. Um, and so, you know, it may be hard to make sure that you have the electric wiring done and et cetera for it. And so when you have an air a central air conditioning, you already have all that electric wiring basically. And, and so all you're doing is replacing the central air conditioner with a heat pump. And in Colorado, at least, you know what? You can, you can get by for a few days without air conditioning by opening the windows, et cetera. So it's not, not as critical in terms of human comfort uh, you know, to wait to replace an air conditioner as it is to replace a gas furnace or, or a uh, hot water heater. Great. Okay, so here's one last question. How would the funds collected by Excel for social cost of carbon be funded back into society's needs? Um, the funds for social cost of carbon are not exactly what this plan entails. They don't actually get funded for that. They're just asked to include it in the economics when they present it to and their analysis, too. right? Okay, so that doesn't it doesn't specify a methodology to uh, transfer those funds back into societal needs. There's yeah, there is no uh, there is no funding for social carbs cost of carbon. It's a it's a factor in their analysis. Yeah. There is no funding going to anyone to cover social costs of carbon. Uh, there is funding that Excel is asking for to reduce emissions in this clean heat plan to cover their costs. Okay, great. I'm just wondering if comments are needed on the HB 24, 1352. Yes, absolutely. Um, you can go to the state uh, legislative. Um, so I, I, I have a, a link, I could provide it to you later, but there's a place to sign up to submit written comments um, about this bill and also the next opportunity to testify or um you know remotely or in person won't be for a, a few weeks but it okay. did pass out of its first committee hearing i encourage everybody to find out more about hb 24-1352 the affordable um healthy appliance bill and um to contact their uh their state representative state senator i want to just thank you both again what a great presentation. I really appreciate it. And I really hope people will uh, make some comments. There it is. There's the info. Uh, that link, puc.colorado.gov, how to participate, will basically take you through the steps. Thank you again, Lauren and Chuck. Really appreciate your time and expertise. Thanks for doing these webinars and for having us. Thank you very much, Mary. Have a good night.